Yes, okay, let's start. So welcome everybody to this uh, to this workshop on uh, this virtual API days event, um, a workshop where we will be talking primarily about API productization. And what that essentially means is that we talk about APIs um, that are essentially turned into assets that are compellingly attractive to your designated consumer audience. So that in itself, that enhanced consumer experience that we are seeking for is one side of the, uh, of the coin that we are referring to in the title. Um, the other side of it is obviously uh, making sure that the process of API productization in itself is facilitated to a maximum extent. So that's the two sides uh, that we will be uh, looking at in detail during this workshop. Welcome once again. My name is Olaf, Olaf van Gorup. I am with the Akana API management platform. Akana, one of the leaders in the API management space. And uh, well, you may or may not be familiar with Akana, but uh, rest assured, we are very much there, even though a lot of what we do is kind of happening behind the scenes. So sometimes it, it does give me the feeling that uh, we are like this utility company, right? that provides these essential services that are kind of taken for granted as long as the service is actually there. Uh, you only realize how essential they are the moment they fail to be delivered. And that is very much uh, the case nowadays with APIs also, as I will try to explain. So if you think of scenarios, for example, where all of a sudden you're no longer able to uh, to access your bank account uh, using your mobile app uh, to see your payment details or do payments uh, with your mobile app or for example if you are suddenly no longer able to book uh, a room with your favorite hotel chain through their mobile app uh, or where you're no longer able to access your favorite video channel for example those are situations where well rather essential services if you will fail to be delivered and the common denominator in these scenarios is that all of these services nowadays are driven through APIs. So that indicates the, uh, yeah, the, 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 uh, the essence of, um, of APIs, the significance of APIs in, uh, in nowadays uh, landscape. Now, I don't think that that in itself uh, is a surprise to you, but something that I think needs to be highlighted is that Yes, we talk APIs, but when we talk about these APIs, we actually talk about a very special category, if you will, of APIs. So I think there is quite a distinction between APIs as, let's say, that, that technical interface that allows two software components to exchange data, to communicate with each other, and APIs like the ones uh, that, that I referred to in these examples just now, that uh, kind of sit at the edge of the enterprise where you really see the interaction between applications and clients. And nowadays they often are third party clients and applications that interact with the enterprise using these APIs so that directly access business data and the functionality around those data through those APIs. So there's a very different breed of APIs, if you will. These are APIs that really are increasingly becoming business assets themselves. Uh, let me just check my notes every now and then to see if I don't forget to mention anything because there's a lot of information that I like to share with you today. And I just wanna make sure that I don't um, forget anything. So, uh, so the APIs that we're talking about here are the APIs that really sit at the edge of the enterprise. So this is where client apps directly interact with indeed uh, the banking API or the hotel chain API, APIs as a business asset. And obviously the moment we start talking about APIs and business, we get onto that field of monetization. And I think with monetization as with APIs, we all have you know, some understanding, some conception, uh, but what often is forgotten uh, with monetization, and by the way, monetization, I, I simply see as, you know, acknowledging that APIs can be a business asset in themselves so that they can actually be a tool, uh, a channel, if you will, to contribute to business revenue, right? So monetization, I suppose we all have some understanding of that, but what often seems to be forgotten somehow is that in order for monetization to work, there are a few prerequisites that need to be addressed. So first of all, of course, uh, and let me now start uh, using my slides, 
um, first of all, you need to make sure that your APIs actually get adopted because without adoption, no monetization. Now, to facilitate or to enhance adoption, uh, you need to make sure that your APIs are sufficiently attractive to that consumer audience, that developer audience that you like to attract, right? So that's where we get onto what we call API productization. So to me, that is very much uh, the first uh, takeaway of this workshop. There's no such thing uh, as API monetization without proper API adoption. There's also no such thing as proper API adoption without proper API productization. And that's why that's the topic for this workshop. So again, API productization, uh, turning your APIs into assets that are compellingly attractive to the developer audience, the consumer audience that you have in mind uh, in order for these developers to start using these APIs, creating these innovative solutions, et cetera, that then hopefully will add to the, uh, the revenue of your, uh, of your business, add value to your business. Now, uh, we're going to show a number of things, of course, uh, how to facilitate API productization. But first of all, let's dive a little deeper into that. So uh, what exactly is it? How does it relate to the wider API landscape? What are some of the things that we should take into consideration here? So essentially, of course, what we talk about is a situation where there is some kind of services architecture present in the, uh, in the context of the enterprise. Uh, and I depicted it as a, as a microservices uh, architecture, a simple microservices architecture here, not without a reason, obviously, because uh, as you may have heard in previous sessions, microservices and their deployments in Kubernetes, uh, even though they allow uh, for access through APIs, there's still a lot of risk associated with it, uh, but we'll get to talk about that. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a microservices architecture, obviously, it's just any services architecture, if you will, that uh, allows access to multiple business functions using an API. So that's one side of, uh, of, the, of the overview here. And then on the other hand, of course, there's your clients, your applications. And in the perspective of this presentation, let's consider them as third-party applications, even though this is very much applicable to internal processes as well. But these client applications, uh, they like to interact with that API. Now, of course, exposing an API from your inner architecture um, in order to make that really attractive and easy to consume by those external parties is typically a little more than just exposing a YAML file or a JSON file. Uh, and as I already mentioned, there's also all kinds of risks and security considerations to take uh, into account. So this is typically, once you start talking about that exchange of data through APIs, where the API product comes into play. And essentially, API products allow you to create this API mediation layer, uh, this API interaction layer. So what it kind of allows you to do is provide the functionality that is accessible through APIs in your services landscape uh, through a product that's really targeting your specific consumer or consumers. So that's where the whole process of API productization starts. So the turning an API into a product means that you take the consumer needs and requirements specifically into account and then start wrapping uh, certain aspects, if you will, around the raw APIs, the endpoints that are available in your services landscape, if you will, uh, in order to make that more attractive. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, considerations here. There's a lot of things that you will need to decide. So for example, um, uh, your API product may actually touch on multiple backend endpoints that all provide a number of operations, a number of resources. So which of these resources do you actually want to make available to which consumer audience, right? So which of these resources are actually exposed through your um, API product? Uh, other things are, uh, do I wish to offer the same kind of subscription plan, the same kind of SLO to each and every consumer? Or do I want to make a distinction there? Uh, that's again something that can be uh, included in your API product. So you can already sense that it's possible to create multiple flavors of that API product designated or targeting different uh, consumers, different consumer categories. Um, what about documentation? What information should I give in order to make my API sufficiently uh, understandable uh, and again, uh, attractive to my, uh, to my consumers? Uh, and this is all very much about 
let's say, the, the content around the API, but there's also considerations like where am I going to make this API product available? Uh, and the where can translate to you know, geographical zones. It can also translate to a number of uh, deployment zones like internal versus external accessibility, for example. So do I open it up to it, the entire world or to uh, a number of my business partners and so on and so forth. So these are kind of the considerations that need to be taken account when you start talking API product with the ultimate objective to make that underlying API um, as presented through the product compellingly attractive to your consumers in order to have them uh, adopt it. And attraction obviously means that it should be easy for them to, to find the API, first of all. Then once they found it, uh, to review uh, and, and kind of understand it. Um, and once that has happened, to really interact with it in terms of testing the API, eventually contracting the API in order to, uh, to really include the functionality into the client application that is being built. Um, now, when you start talking API product uh, discoverability and providing information, you probably quickly think about the relevance of an API portal or an API marketplace, as it's often uh, called nowadays. And yes, very true. An API marketplace is a very important step in, in promoting and publishing your API product. What is very important again here is that uh, you should take care uh, to provide information that is really relevant to each and every stakeholder that may have an interest in that API product. Uh, so what that means to say is that you probably do not want to just provide the technical information uh, or the information details regarding the API, but also information that may be attractive to a rather less tech-savvy audience, right? So there may be decision makers that are more with the business side of things, so to speak, than with the tech slash IT side of things. Uh, and in order to attract these people, you also need to be able to give information that helps them to understand what this so-called API is all about and what potential value it may give. And then once they get satisfied, they can, of course, uh, give the assignment to the developers that will then uh, start looking into the real technical details of the API. So API Marketplace, very important from a content perspective, targeting all of these different stakeholders that potentially have an interest in that API. Um, so, um, but it's not just uh, content, of course, that's relevant here, because once developers start digging into that API, they probably want to you know, get a real feeling of what that API is all about. So they want to in interact with the API, which means they want to be able to test it. And again, ultimately, uh, they want to be able to, let's say, connect that API to the actual applications that are building in the live production environment. Uh, so that means that the information that you present in your API marketplace needs to be in sync with the actual runtime operational environment of the, of the entire underlying API infrastructure. Um, so that's why from an Akama perspective, we always say that it's so very, very significant to have your marketplace slash portal be an integrated part of the entire underlying API management infrastructure so that you can ensure that synchronicity, that the moment changes take place that affect whatever is being um, published in that marketplace is immediately updated, is immediately in sync so that developers, uh, both from a testing uh, experience as well as from a production experience, never um, get into a situation where suddenly uh, their client apps no longer work because uh, they weren't aware of the changes that were being implemented, right? So that integration, uh, very, very important. It's not just about content. An API marketplace is also very much about ensuring that connectivity between client and, um, and uh, API backend, if you will. So um, kind of a brief summary. So what we talk about when we talk about API products is really that consumer-oriented asset that is sufficiently attractive uh, for the developers to uh, to check out, engage with, uh, hopefully uh, use in their live production situation uh, from the client's perspective. Um, so um, that's all. That's all very good. Uh, I think we probably now have a bit of an understanding of of what it is API productization and why it is significant. 
Now, of course, we need to make sure that we facilitate that entire process so that it not becomes a hindrance to, you know, to the developers uh, in, uh, of, in its own. Um, and that's um, when we start looking at productization, productization really from the provider perspective. Now, in this day and age, where we start to talk increasingly about hyper automation, it, of course, makes fantastic sense from the provider perspective to, uh, let's say, require that all of this API productization in itself should be uh, automated to a maximum extent. And that's also what we really should be aiming for, I think. So um, on this slide, on the left side, a, a quick summary of, you know, all of the uh, consumer side benefits that uh, I have been mentioning just now. So it's important uh, from a product perspective, you know, to ensure the discoverability, to make sure that you have your detailed targeted documentation that really corresponds with the needs of specific consumer stakeholders. And then, of course, you need to provide uh, API testing capabilities, API contracting capabilities, um, and something that I haven't mentioned yet, but that is, of course, also essential, uh, the feedback that you are able to get once you actually start using that API. So everything in terms of metrics and analytics that you can have visibility on to make sure that your API is behaving as it should, that it's actually providing the value that you expect from it. So. That's the consumer experience, well, the one side of the coin. The other side is the entire API uh, productization process in itself. So if we look at it from, a, from optimizing a, um, uh, the productization process from the provider perspective, uh, then again, it's very much about making sure that things are seamlessly integrated with any existing uh, programs, um, ways of working that are already there. So uh, one of the main recommendations is, of course, that API productization in itself should be seamlessly integrated with an existing CI/CD uh, program, obviously. So what that means uh, in concrete steps is that creating the API product in itself should be an automated process. Uh, any updates that are implemented in that product should be an automated process. Similarly, when you think of promoting your API product across its life cycles, because obviously just as your, let's say your services and any of the, um, uh, the components that you are building or that are being built by your DevOps teams go through particular life cycle stages, just so your API product will go through life cycle stages. And it's very well, uh, you can very well think of a situation where the CI CD pipeline first triggers API product creation um, and that the, the, the API product platform, so you will, is waiting for the next trigger from the CI CD pipeline to make sure that the API product is promoted from its inception stage to its, let's say, testing stage to its uh, staging stage, eventually the corresponding uh, production stages. Um, so automated promotion is another very important aspect. Uh, and then, of course, we have automated deployment. And this is something that uh, is not giving too much um, attention, typically, in my opinion. But it's, of course, essential that your API product uh, is going to be deployed in those deployment zones <laughs> where it's supposed to be deployed. Hey, did I get a question there? Hello, hello. No, just the sound. So I think it's very important to talk about deployment also. So exactly in which geographical regions, for example, should your, uh, your API be available? Um, should it be deployed across multiple geographical zones, multiple regions? And that, of course, may be different from one API to the next. So somehow uh, the process has to be driven. How that process is driven, we will see shortly. And then last but not least, your API product should be available, uh, not only deployment-wise in the regions where you want to have it available, it should also be available in the corresponding uh, API portals, API marketplaces, right? So that's kind of um, an introduction to um, the whole process of API productization, the topic of API productization. Now let's see how that could look like in a real-world scenario. Uh, so that means we are going to, yes, we're going to a demo situation. So this is where it gets really exciting, right? Um, 
So in this demo situation, I want to show a number of things. So obviously all of the provider aspects I would like to touch here. So we'll look at automated API product provisioning. Uh, we'll briefly look at promotion capabilities and then we'll see what can be done to make that product really, really attractive in terms of additional documentation um, and additional assets that really help your uh, prospective consumers to get a proper understanding of what this particular API is, is all about and how it could help them to actually implement the use cases that they intend to implement in their client applications. So um, for a start, let's uh, look at an API. Actually, let me start by looking at an API that's already there. And as an example, uh, I thought it nice to use um, an example that's associated with um, the demo application that is typically provided if you uh, if you install uh, Istio, so a service mesh app application. It comes with what they call a book info application, which is an application that consists of a number of microservices. And then um, there is an API uh, associated with it, created with it, that allows you to actually interact with that application apart from the user interface that it automatically comes with. Now, that API is in itself available through a Swagger document, but is that really something that you could expose directly through a, uh, an external consumer audience, so to speak? Um, personally, I think not. And uh, one of the things that you could do if you start thinking about product, uh, productization is something like this. So what I've done here is I've imported that Swagger document into the Akana platform. And what you then get is immediate feasibility on all of the operations that are available out of the box, right? So this is actually what, uh, what you should be able to access there. And uh, I'm not even sure if I have my Kubernetes environments up. I think I do. And if that's the case, then I should even be able to call that API, right? So rather than just having uh, at your disposal, um, you know, a bunch of JAML files, you now actually get an interface that allows you to have a much better understanding assuming that you know nothing of the application and the, uh, and the associated API of what an API is providing. Now, this is, of course, a very simple first step because this is nothing but a reflection of that API. There has been no productization really apart from the fact that we now have a user interface to access it. So you even saw that I could directly access this API without providing any, uh, any credentials, for example. So it's still the open API as it is also uh, exposed by default on the uh, Kubernetes slash Istio environment. So let's take that a little step further. So let's move to my dev portal here um, and create that same product, but now with a number of requirements taken into account. So these are requirements that could be taken care of by, let's say, an API product management team. Um, for example, uh, including an API product owner that will then decide, okay, we're now gonna create this API. We're going to make this available to a particular consumer audience, but there's a number of um, uh, critical decisions that we want to have implemented with this API product. So for example, it should certainly not be anonymously accessible. We always want it to be accessed uh, in an authenticated slash authorized manner. So we prefer to apply OAuth to it, for example, meaning a client application that wants now to uh, invoke this API, sends requests to this API, will need to provide a valid OAuth access token. And then secondly, I want to indicate where I eventually, once it leaves development and moves towards production, uh, for which audience I want to make it available. So is that an internal audience? Uh, is it something that is used to um, improve my internal processes? Or do I really want to offer it as a product to uh, let's say third party consumers. And for this particular example, let's assume the latter case is going to be exposed externally. There's of course other uh, criteria that can be taken into account as part of this API profile that we are now creating. And that's an important concept, right? So what we essentially do is create API products based on an underlying API profile that can be designed, considered if you will, by an API product team that may or not may or may not be part of the DevOps teams that are responsible for creating the actual code, right? This is all a matter of how you uh, create your organizational structure, obviously. Um, the important thing is that this API profile is essentially a collection of metadata. So there are metadata with values that then drive 
the initial configuration of the API product, and that will also drive its uh, progression uh, from one lifecycle uh, stage to the next. Uh, ultimately, uh, for example, meaning that that API will be available in an external zone rather than an internal zone, potentially both, that it may be deployed in the US uh, region as well as in the European region, or both, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So all of these aspects are driven through metadata and all these metadata are captured in the API profile. And that profile is gonna be uh, a part of the uh, script that we will invoke right now to create another flavor of this product in our dev environment. So let me quickly copy this call here. Because I'm not even really a developer, but I'm still kind of laid back when it comes to these things. So. You can see here that I uh, invoke uh, an automation script. That script essentially contains of all of the calls that are required uh, to invoke the necessary APIs on, in this case, the Akana uh, platform itself. And as a result of this action, you will see that uh, an API product is created, is initialized, called AD Book Info API with the date of today. So it's an API days Book Info API in my dev environment. So if I log in, as the developer under whose credentials this API product is created, which, by the way, may be an account that is not or that is completely transparent to uh, the person that, uh, that runs the script. But this is the account on which I can review this API in the, in the UI in this case. So if you look here, then we should find an AD book info API, and there it is, right? So this is the very same uh, this is a product based on the very same Swagger uh, document that we just saw in the playground environment. But if you now look at the details here, then suddenly we'll see, uh, if I look at the implementations, that it is no longer an anonymously accessible API, um, which you can see here. In fact, based on the profile, a number of policies have already been associated with this API. So here you see a first step in the productization process where you say, hey, we know that this is going to be a secure API. Let me actually go back and show you the metadata details. Perhaps that makes a little more sense, makes it a little more understandable. So you can see these are elements that are part of the API profile that I was uh, mentioning, right? So uh, you can see that it's meant for external exposure. Um, we have made it medium available. Um, that's just the choice. Um, and it does have access to critical information, which means that we want to have some uh, uh, API security applied to it. In this case, the um, the, the OAuth policy. Uh, obviously, different API metadata will result in a very different uh, API product being created. Uh, similarly, once you start promoting this product across the lifecycle, uh, it may mean that it ends up in you know different uh, production deployment zones. So this particular API, should it be promoted all the way, will end up in the uh, external production uh, zone, if you will. Um, if I had chosen the metadata to be internal rather than external, it would have ended up in an internal deployment zone. Obviously, you could also have, uh, have it end up in both. And these deployment zones can be anything. So they can be, like I said, they can be uh, geography uh, related, they can be um, network zone related, and so on and so forth. So even by metadata, you allow your product uh, to be deployed um, even across clouds, right? So in a multi-cloud approach. So that's one example that I would like uh, to show, a basic example. Now let's look at an example that may be more significant in an open banking slash embedded finance situation. Uh, embedded finance in itself, obviously, is a very fine example of these consumer-oriented APIs that we need to create. Because yes, here we have parties that now would like to have the possibility to include payment information into the applications that they are building as part of an extended service. Um, they now need to be able to quickly find API products that actually help them implement that information, right? So if I, as a bank, um, uh, would make a lousy job of presenting my API, then chances that anyone with such an interest uh, would simply go to another provider in order to use that API. So it may be a, bis a missed business opportunity for me. Okay, so let's create a second API, one that is probably, uh, like I said, a little more relevant in an open banking slash um, embedded finance perspective. So I'm gonna run 
the same script, but it's a slightly different profile, as we will see. So the result of this is, once the script has completed, an API that should be called AD Payment Initiation. So again, let's go back to our portal user interface. This, by the way, is uh, the Akana uh, portal in its view for API admins. Um, we'll, we'll see shortly that there are different views onto that. So again, let's refresh the view of my APIs. That should be a second AD API now. Here it is. So this payment initiation API is using a slightly different profile. So if you look at the details here of the metadata, you will see that also it's apparently meant for external um, consumption. Um, we expect um, low availability, which uh, is something that is disputable, I think. Uh, very importantly, uh, it has to adhere to the financial API um, specification. So that's why that uh, element has been set to true. And again, it's giving access to critical information. So both of these latter metadata, of course, indicate that we require some uh, significant security implementation with this API. Again, if you show the implementation details, so these are the, let's say, the operational details of this particular API product at this stage. And we again look at the policies and we see that indeed there is again that OAuth policy, but in this case, uh, as required under the UK Open Banking spec, uh, as well as FAPI, there is also a uh, JOSE security, so a JSON uh, signature encryption security policy associated with the API. Um, so again, that's based on the on the profile that we have used. Quick check on the time. I think we still have 20 minutes, so we're good to go. Um, okay, so this is a payment um, uh, API, um, again, based on the input, in this case, the API profile, as well as the underlying Swagger slash open API document, you can see that all of the documentation um, has been generated for this API. Now, that in itself uh, is, of course, a great start. But is this eventually uh, really what you wish to expose to your, uh, to your consumers? Um, so again, think of your different stakeholders. They may be uh, non-tech savvy stakeholders compared to um, to uh, the developers that really need uh, to know all about the technical details of the API. So different stakeholders. And at the same time, when I am looking at this API and I'm thinking of the use case that I wish to implement, then where exactly now am I going to start, right? Because even with visibility on all of this, um, uh, it's still a bit of a struggle to figure out what I now should do first. Uh, from a provider perspective, of course, you may also consider, hey, um, we, we do not really need to expose all of these capabilities because we know that there are consumers out there that are essentially only interested in creating domestic payments, for example. So our API product could very simply only contain the operations as they are relevant from a domestic payment uh, use case situation, right? So the product does not really need to reflect all of the underlying functionality as it's offered through the um, through the raw APIs, uh, so to speak. So what now are some additional steps we can do? First of all, we can, of course, add documentation. So all of the uh, descriptions uh, given with all of these operations in themselves can get additional uh, descriptive information. Um, a next step in terms of documentation would certainly be the creation of what we call an API recipe, which is uh, more of a custom documentation bit with embedded uh, platform, API platform management uh, elements in it. And I will show you an example shortly. Um, uh, you might, of course, start considering um, consumption plans, subscription plans. So uh, what are the conditions under which I want to make this API available to different consumer categories? So we can associate a number of subscription plans with the product in order to allow uh, different categories of consumers to make uh, to make uh, an informed decision. Um, now, all of this is, of course, still in its initial stage. We are still in our dev environment. Um, obviously, the moment I am happy with what I have created in my dev environment, I want to start promoting it, uh, which, like I mentioned before, can be in response to uh, something from the from the from your CI/CD pipeline. So, for example. The code has been tested. Um, it's now ready to be uh, transferred to its uh, to its testing or staging environment. 
that's the moment when also your API product that got response to that code should be uh, transported. So I could either hit this promote button here to make that happen. But again, uh, this is of course in itself an API call to the Akana platform. So it's something that could also be triggered directly from the, um, from the platform. Um, so eventually, and now let me simply switch to uh, the production environment where there's already something present. And let me log in here as an administrator. And then shortly we'll, we'll look at the marketplace to see what the developers, um, you know, the consumers are actually going to see. So this is the view from, let's say, an API administrator, right? So if I look here, uh, you will see that there's already this payment initiation API, right? Which um, uh, has already been enhanced to some extent by a number of things. So for example, we have created uh, additional documentation, including a recipe. Um, we may have done something with the visibility of this API. Yes, so there is some subscription plans uh, associated with it. So that means that if I, as a consumer, am interested in this API, I may get a very different visibility of what is what is available for me as a particular uh, or a consumer belonging to a particular designated category, right? Now, in terms of publishing that API uh, product, uh, you'd rather not have a portal environment like this one. You'd rather have uh, something that is more, uh, how do you say that, um, that's targeting different users, right? So it should not immediately give you that, that the technological um, feel. So if I were now to interact with this uh, finance API, let me first log in. So we already have done that. Let me just log in as a developer from a partner organization that somehow wishes to utilize a payment API. So I'm logging in and let me just get back one step. Right now, as a developer, I would obviously be interested in the technical details. If I were a, let's say, a business representative or somebody with a less uh, technological background, potentially I would first like to see some information that is less technical, that really articulates the potential business value that such an API product may have for me. And this is, of course, a very simple example, but it kind of shows you uh, the different views on ultimately the same product that you should be able to create in order to make that product attractive, understandable to these different stakeholders. So this is something that could be the entrance for, you know, the less tech savvy people. And once you think like, okay, I'm actually interested in the technical details, that's when uh, you move on to the, um, to the details as they are, uh, how do you say that, uh, embedded in this portal environment, if you will, from the underlying API management platform, in this case, uh, the Akana platform. So again, all of this stuff that you see here is largely coming from the imported Swagger document with some enhancements made uh, to make it more um, digestible, if you will, by, um, by uh, developers. So you can see that there's some additional description here. Operations may have additional descriptive text, even though I did not do it here, I see. Um, but in terms of real utilization, you still have to answer that question like, how now am I going to implement my uh, domestic payment use case? And that's where something that we call API recipes comes into place, right? So a recipe is essentially, you might say, kind of a custom uh, documentation bit that you can add to your products that really describes the functionality of a subset of API operations from, for example, a specific use case perspective. And in the text, you can, of course, provide all of the content you like that helps to understand what this API product is all about and how you should interact with it. More importantly, all of the technical details, so let me hit uh, this link here, will still be coming directly from the underlying API management platform. So all of the information that you see embedded here is not something that it, I will have to manually update whenever there's a change. It's actually directly coming from the underlying API infrastructure, always in sync with that infrastructure. Whereas this content, of course, could be changed, uh, if you will, will to a very large extent be static because yeah, the use case in itself probably will not change that much over time. And if it does, you probably want to have a very different recipe anyway. So what this kind of intends to show is that if you are a developer that is not really too familiar yet with, let's say, the intricacies of an actual open banking API, then you see here outlined, clearly outlined, 
what it is that you have to do and what it is that you will have to implement in your client's application to successfully not only call this particular resource, right? Because this is just a first operation in uh, a list of uh, five in this case that all need to be invoked in order to eventually uh, be able to, uh, to raise a payment request, uh, but also how uh, these various operations should be called. So for example, let's just have a quick run since we have a little time to do that uh, to see how it works, right? So if you look at all of the details here, you see that from a security perspective, you first of all need to provide an OAuth token. Then the payload that you provide needs to be signed um, using a detached JSON web token approach. Um, and of course you need to provide a valid uh, request payload. Um, no token without client credentials. So let's first make sure that we get that. Um, the fact that we need to sign and encrypt here means that we need to use a key store. So it's not just the client identifier that I need. I also need to provide an actual key store to work with. Obviously, oh, sorry. Um, that was a bit too quick. So this is the key store we're going to use. I obviously need the password for this key store. Okay, I need to save that. So the key store has now been loaded. Uh, I can now request an access token, an OAuth access token. Here it is, right, with the proper scope, in this case, uh, a payments scope. And then the next step is where you normally would have to somehow create that detached uh, JSON web token uh, digest that needs to be contained in one of the HTTP headers. Um, the nice thing about the Akana test client is that it allows you to actually create that on the fly. Uh, while testing. Um, now, this is, of course, highly dynamic information that may be different for any API. So that's why I still have to kind of copy paste these things in um, manually. But yeah, copy pasting is at least feasible as compared to, you know, really needing to figure it out from the very start. This is important because this really has to correspond to the C name of the, uh, the qualified name of the certificate that we are using, the key store that we are using. So we have to be careful copying that. And this is just uh, a dummy value that represents I trust anchor. The value simply has to correspond with anything that we have configured. So um, all of the constraints are now adhered to. So now I should actually be able to successfully invoke this API. And lo and behold, I can. So you see that a response is actually returned. It's given me a consent ID, which is the start of your payment, uh, of your payment use case. Uh, I could actually invoke it a number of times uh, if I want to. This is still a test situation, even though it represents a production environment uh, in the demo. Um, and you see that it's actually returning dynamic information. I could then, of course, pick up this consent ID and carry on with the next operation in line, which is to review that consent, right? So that's something that you would need to be taken care of in your client's application. And the false value has already been provided here. But in this case, I could be using this value select my client, um, you know, get an OAuth token again for this particular operation and then invoke that um, operation and so on and so forth until I have completed these ones. Now, this, of course, is something that is really, really helpful if you want to understand this particular API product and its underlying functionality, not just from a functional perspective, but also from a perspective in terms of, you know, what constraints apply to it, what security requirements do I have to comply with, etc. Um, so we're near the end of what I would like to show. There's one or two things that I, we haven't touched on, and that's that element of feedback, right? So once I am uh, interacting with my API, I also need to get proper visibility, starting with a testing situation, but eventually also propagated to a production situation that explains to me, that tells me uh, how well my API is doing. Uh, is it responding as I expect it to be? Do I see any uh, suspicious uh, requests uh, coming by, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and in order to give you a little bit more of a flavor of that, let's run this thing a number of times. And then let's also tweak some of the things. So for example, what I could do is make sure that this uh, no longer matches. So that means that the Jose security policy will now fail, right? Um, because it can no longer match uh, that CN against what is given in the key store. So in this case, yes, it actually says that something is not correct in the Jose header. So please uh, make sure that you um, review that. Um, so of course I can now quickly 
correct it, then we should be good to go again. Verify that. Yep. Similarly, of course, with OWALS. I mean, if I somehow would tweak the access token, um, the OAuth policy should fail, right? So if I call it now, then I would probably get a 401 response, which indeed we see because the token is not is not valid, right? So there's a number of situations that you can very quickly uh, test out. Let's get a new token and nothing changed here. So again, it should give us a 201, right? Now, in order for, let's say, consumers to get a first glimpse of what is really happening with that API, um, we even provide in this portal view, in this marketplace view, um, an overview of all of the transactions that have been executed. So this is information that you can or cannot expose, of course, but certainly in pre-production situation and something to be switched on in production eventually uh, may be very useful, right? So you can see here that uh, all of your transactions are actually, are actually captured with all of the metadata associated with it. Um, you can also see that there's a number of 401s and 400 responses that have occurred. Now, in the marketplace view, this is fairly basic, what we show. If you would, of course, go and have a look at this from the, um, uh, from the management perspective, you would get even more information. So if I look at the same analytics here, then you will see that um, I hit the logs, right? That I can actually uh, even uh, just filter on, on the failures, for example, um, look at what, what exactly has been put in. So what was my request? What headers were associated with it? Um, what was the response, et cetera, et cetera. I could even go, it's not been configured for this API, but I could even, even go downstream and see whatever has happened there. So, um, Another talk. Uh, I hope also a bit of a compelling demo of what what it is that comes into play once you start uh, considering API productization. I certainly hope that the relevance, the significance of API productization uh, has been brought a little bit more to life for you uh, and how the whole process of managing your API products is something that is still quite distinct from managing the APIs at, let me say, the lower levels in the architecture. In itself also essential but there still seem to be very different responsibilities, probably dealt with by different users um, with different, uh, how do you say that, um, capabilities and so on. So as a very quick summary of the two sides that we have been discussing, I think overall we see an increased significance of API productization. Uh, I think people start to realize more and more that it's absolutely essential for successful API monetization essential uh, API adoption. Um, what needs to be done is really to make these APIs as attractive as possible in order for developers to really uh, embrace them, if you will. Um, a very good place to start is, of course, your API marketplace, where you can provide all of the information, taking into account different stakeholder groups with their own needs and requirements that all need to be satisfied. Um, uh, business content fairly static. So there you can really focus on, let's say, the layout, on, on, on how attractive it is presented in terms of look and feel. The technical information should be in line with the actual runtime operation, uh, operational environment of the API in order to make sure that you have a seamless uh, data flow there. Um, and then we have looked at uh, how we can optimize the experience from both a provider perspective as well as a consumer perspective. So provider perspective, you know, taking into account a hyper automation approach, automate wherever possible, uh, make sure that you integrate it with your uh, existing CI CD program from a consumer perspective, make sure that you have your documentation in place, that you make sure uh, that you uh, attract consumers from their respective stakeholders perspective, uh, that you allow for proper testing, allow for proper feedback, etc. One minute left, I think, for any quick questions that there may still be. And otherwise, you can find me at the uh, Akana booth, obviously, during the remainder of the event. I'm also looking at the chat, not entirely sure what I should be seeing. But otherwise, I thank you very much for your attention. Hope to be in touch. And uh, good luck with your API productization efforts. Thank you.